And welcome to the bi-monthly Industry 4.0 community podcast put on by 4.0 Solutions. I am your host, Walker D. Reynolds. This is actually a pre-recorded podcast that's going to be uh, published, I believe, Tuesday, June 27th, 2023. Our discussion today is going to be centered around Node-RED and Industry 4.0. We're going to get a couple of other discussions today. The the guests are Oriol Rius, um, who is located in Spain, and Klaus Landsdorf, who is located in Germany. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Real quick, Oriol and Klaus, you guys, you guys obviously don't, uh, people know who you are, but if you guys want to go ahead and, and uh, uh, quickly introduce yourselves, we'll start with you, Oriol. Okay, uh, then just um, three things to retain about me. Just uh, the first thing, it's I'm a passionate technologist, so I started programming computers when I was nine. So 37 years ago, <laughs> uh, since that time. Uh, this is the second thing. I started uh, nine companies. The last one is called Nexiona.com. It's a private industrial Internet of Things platform. When I say private, I mean you cannot go to the cloud to set up your device. You cannot do that. <laughs> it's private. <laughs> and and third thing, it's uh, since uh, three, four years ago, I'm uh, focusing my career on sharing that uh, knowledge, that experience, uh, uh, and pointing on creativity for solving issues of people as a consultant and as a teacher. Excellent. So you're still with uh, Nexiona, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, the product architect. I'm okay. part time there, so designing the new generation of the product. Okay, with a team, but uh, I enjoy also my time as as teacher and as a, a consultant. Let me say, playing in a sandbox. What it has to be uh, the future of, of Industry 4.0 at the end, no? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and Klaus, Klaus Landsdorf. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, my voice is a bit damaged today, but hopefully okay for the video. And I also started really early uh, with, uh, with PC programming, but was not possible in that time really to learn it as, a, as, a, as my daily work at the end. So I first started to become an electrician. Um, so that's the way why we also really experienced in, in uh, IoT at the end because we're not just software developers we also know how it works with the uh, with the cables and all this stuff and that was uh, also a point really where I started to to learn about automation at the end and then was really impressed from that field of um, you know, working with PC and electricians uh, together and all these skills and so I really started as a trainee <clears throat> then I uh, yeah, learned and had a great project uh, and a lot of uh, new uh, innovative stuff what I developed over time. I started with OPC UA in 2009, really the very first beta versions. And um, then I was really impressed of, of that um, because it gives me much more as a software developer than just a protocol. It's really a technology for me. It saves a lot of time. Um, so, and that was the point where I also invested my, my whole study time from bachelor to master and all this stuff. Um, but then I met... Uh, Node Red over time and uh, combined all these um, what I love and uh, today I try really to go with open source in our company also in my company I have my own company for especially um, edge computing at the moment uh, because we have a lot of knowledge in that space and we believed really early in that space uh, not to go to the cloud we said every time hey we want to stay on site and to develop really open things with uh, with open source really to go to go ahead. Um, so that the um, more your skills are, um, you know, the point where you depend or you selecting from what is the right solution for your problem. Mm -hmm. So, so for the audience who's watching, it, it, here's how you probably know Klaus. So if you've been dabbling with node red at all, and you <laughs> want to connect node red to an OPC server, um, then you're almost certainly using the node red contrib OPC UA node in node red and klaus is the um you're the owner of that node now and have been for since like 2015 2016 something like that right the iot opcua nodes yeah because i first started also with like modbus uh to work on the normal opc ua package which is uh 
based on the idea of Mika Kareya, and uh, he was um, also from Walmart Automation, a really a guy for automation stuff, and he had great ideas to bring Modbus and OPC UA to Node-RED really, really early in 2015, I, I mean. So I started to um, invest in that project, it was really great, and then we separated it because my idea was more to go the educational way, to show people what are the parts of um, the technology and not just to give uh, what the idea of Mika was to give a tiny tool with some nodes, which is really close to client and server to use it uh, really easily. Um, so that was the history. And so I really started also to, to work with Etienne from Node OPC UA to you know, night by night, we worked on the development to, to writing tests, to bring it further. And also today we try to get in a partnership um, with Staff Life, uh, which is a company um, also um, for Indiationware to bring this further for the open source world at the end. So how we came together. So this is actually, um, <laughs> you know, it's really um, um, total randomness, the way that this, this we got joined. I, I did a post on LinkedIn, um, Node Red had released their first community survey since 2019. And, what, and I, I received a notification in my email and um, I was not surprised by the results, but I had been received. I, I got a bunch of messages from members of the community going, look at how the look at how much the adoption of Node Red has exploded in industry. Like since since 2009, between 2019 and 2023, the growth of Node Red in industry has been meteoric. There's no way to describe it other than meteoric. I mean, it's literally nearly a vertical line going yeah. up in terms of total usage, right? So I, my post was Node Red just released the results of their community survey. Is anyone surprised to hear that they've seen an explosion of use in industry for IIoT projects? MQTT and HTTP are the two most common protocols along with a surge of OPC UA and Modbus. I went down the rabbit hole last night after playing with Flowforge all day, and the results are pretty astounding. If you're not using open platforms with common open technology, building IoT solutions in service of a digital strategy, you need to ask yourself why. And, you know, I had been thinking, and, you know, I use, I use Node-RED quite a bit. Our engineers here, in, you know, I own an engineering firm and we have a con this education and outreach arm. That's primarily what I do. I teach. I don't work on projects anymore. But I, I think I do similar to what Oriole does. So when I was yeah. <laughs> doing the prep, when I was doing the prep, one of the things that was given to me by the team was uh, – it says, in terms of technical expertise, Oriole is a, a GNU Linux enthusiast and has extensive experience as a systems administrator. And although mm -hmm. he doesn't particularly enjoy working as a programmer, he is well-versed in various languages, C, C++, Java, Python, PHP. He spends around 20 hours a week programming, which is what I do. I spend about 20 hours a week programming, <laughs> yeah. primarily for creating alpha versions or addressing proof of concept challenges. That's me. Correct. Right. I, I, <laughs> I get things to 50, 60, 70 percent and they get handed over to someone else to finish. Right. That's what I do. Correct. And, and part of what was coming through, by the way, I do that with Node-RED all the time. So I'll yeah, use yeah. Node-RED as the as my proof of concept platform. Um, right. I'll use it to wireframe visualizations, to wireframe architecture. That's one of the beauties. Right. You, your nodes, your nodes can be the step in the architecture. And so I Correct. use it all the time to wireframe in that way. Mm. But the more I started thinking about it, the more I started thinking about it, as, especially after the survey came out, a lot of people would ask me, you know, do you use Node-RED in production? And the answer is rarely. I would say I answered rarely. But I, I, I started asking myself why. <laughs> what was the reason I was using it rarely? And most of the time it was because I didn't want to fight the open source battle. That was oh, yeah. the... You know the organization that is averse to open source mm -hmm. right correct so in that linkedin post this guy larry griffiths commented and it was larry who put us together he he talked about how he had been using node red in production environments forever i mean since yeah. the very beginning and i yeah. and i invited him on the podcast and he actually suggested i invite klaus and then it was oriel and that and, and so we're to we're together today so let's start there Node red in production, right? Because I think this is a question most people have. Where does node red fit in industry four architectures? Where does it fit 
as part of a much larger digital transformation initiative. Klaus, in your perspective, Oriel, in your perspective, you obviously believe Node-RED is production ready. That is, it is, it is robust enough to be a link in a very important technical supply chain within an organization. Tell me why. Yeah. Just, just let me answer with a fast question. Okay, worker. If in two years after saying deploy, you don't go back to that factory, uh, you don't have to do anything. You can say it is production ready in two years, just two years. Yeah. It's good enough? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. This is the last success that they have with Node-RED. The last, not the first, you know? And this is a production line for uh, Mercedes-Benz, for, you know, the, the, the yep. PCB that controls yep. the complete car. It's the QA line for that PCB. So it's not minor thing. In two years, I didn't receive a call until last week. What happened? They need a new database connection for tracing much more data. And what are you using Node-RED for there? Is it is it data ops? Is it data ingestion, transformation? Yeah. And is that what you're doing? Is that no, what let, let, primarily? It, in that concrete case, okay? Not, gener not generalization, okay? In that concrete yep. case, we have a line completely controlled by S7 from Siemens, okay? Uh, so all the automations and the controls, it's that PLC, okay? And then, as you already said, worker, shh. Don't say this is open source. Just right. say this is a, an embedded PC. Right. We need an embedded PC for completing the project with the requirements that you launched. What was the requirements? Easy. SQL injection of the tracing data of all the tests that we do. Controlling uh, 3D vision cameras. Okay. Controlling QR uh, code recorder with la laser. This is pronounced laser, yeah. Yep. And all some other small, uh, yeah, uh, 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 an, ink, an ink printer. And no yeah. one knows how to control that if they don't install Windows with a lot of drivers, with a lot of licenses, uh, with a visual basic uh, uh, code for controlling all that stuff. And they said, why? Can you do that for next Monday? It was Friday. Yeah. Of course, yes, I can. Well, but we don't have the drivers for Linux of all that stuff. It's just a regular ink printer. It's just a, a regular serial protocol for the... I mean, in just a weekend, with maybe 12 hours working during the weekend, it was enough for controlling the complete or for complementing the complete control of that S7 PLC with, uh, <clears throat> with that stuff that it was impossible to do if they don't install Windows with Visual Basic stuff, with blah, 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 with a lot of proprietary stuff that no one knows how to maintain that. And for me, this is the key, the word maintain, maintenance. Yeah. I don't know, Klaus, if you agree with that. But uh, what I really love about Node-RED, it is after two years, if I go back to the flow, in less than a minute, I know what I have to touch, what I have to modify. How I mean, the maintenance, it's intuitive. If you have code there, maybe you have 12 lines, maybe you have five lines, maybe 20 lines, but you don't have 200 lines. Because right. if you do that, you are not using no red. <laughs> okay, you are doing something wrong. That what I mean, it is for me, the value of no red is the maintenance. Then in general, uh, and just to be short, because Klaus has to give his version, sorry, Klaus. Uh, <laughs> from my perspective, <laughs> What it's easy to insert no red in production ready uh, projects is where there is n no other things or no other cheap things that can do all that you know, the, all that you have to do for that project. For instance, uh, multiple device control, proprietary devices with no easy, I mean, you have the specification of the protocol, but there is no driver of that protocol because everything is proprietary, everything is, is locked. Right. And then to have that platform that you can control to the last bit is your, your flexibility, your dynamism, your creativity can explode, no? can be busting the project in, in a short period of time. Um, but if I have the chance to choose, not to fix, eh? this is another thing, okay? Choose. In my perspective, 
not red can be can be the um how can i say the integration part that connects the field bus protocols with it is that the I, is that the predominant use case for you oriel is that is, is, is it's the shim it's the let shim let me say 30 40% right. of the cases okay got it all right okay cloud. not 100% huh cloud, cloud. sorry uh, production ready your obviously your position is going to be yes node red is robust enough for production solution production level solutions but your There's argument also- in that case cuz by the way this i mean this is a common objection you you'll hear you know the common objection will be yeah node red is great for poc it's great for wide wire framing it's great for you know one off use cases some maybe i'm going to deploy an edge device i'm going to acquire some data and then i'm going to remove that edge device it's not going to stay there forever but the the argument predominantly is can i should i really be using it in production so klaus your your take there yeah perfect um yeah it's really my point also um i was really I got this question over the last eight years a lot. Uh, so often people ask me, hey, can we go with production? And I said until version three, no, completely no. Um, that was my perspective. I every time said it's just my perspective. If you try it, I know a lot of people like Lawrence, they, they are really successful. We saw some some projects like Open Wallbox, uh, which, which used our Modbus package <clears throat> to control uh, our car. Um, electrical car charging uh, really well with this because it takes just a bit of data to collect them, to organize them, and that's it. Uh, but if I think on production, I also have some some more long-term support in mind. And that means we need to be uh, backward compatible. We need some um, migration of existing flows, et cetera. And that was not existing until version 3 for me because if I took my very early flows from version one and put it to two, uh, everything was broken from right. it because it was string or number was whatever. So this was uh, one step where uh, uh, I also worked with this, I, I where I really can say the team, the core team of Node-RED was really great to go with that problems and to say, hey, we solved that really fast. Uh, we discussed, um, that's great. Also the community have to discuss with the core team. Does it make sense or doesn't it? And it, uh, that makes a more high quality process over time than you have in every other software for me, because where do you have the ability uh, to talk with a lot of people with real use cases, if that makes sense or not. And with version three, we saw also it's backward compatible. Boom. That was the last point, what we missed. And now from version three, I really can say from my perspective, it's absolutely uh, production ready Flowforge also brings the last step what we missed uh, of organizing <laughs> no dread uh, i think we also talk about this later uh, but this was for me also a point which really which really was pain i think also for a lot of people they use that in mass uh, deployments or something like this they have to find a way how to bring the flows on it the settings security credentials uh, whatever so yeah, yeah. i mean the, it- here's the pro- here's the the real question that came up which was if if node red i mean this is a, a logical point if node red is not production ready then what's the purpose of flowforge right <laughs> like if if you're if if you're not going to use node red at scale so you're going to deploy it at scale across an organization in production solutions then what's the point of flowforge this was totally the question that i asked myself in, and yeah. it was sort of this light bulb moment before i did that post because i'll be honest with you my opinion of node red has changed since i went down the rabbit hole you know in you know researching how flowforge has evolved over the last you know how it's evolved over say the last 12 months and um you know my position today is that node red is in fact production ready however i have a couple of standing questions right the mm-hmm. questions for example uh, klaus you know you lead you you know there's a lot of contributors to the OPC UA node in Node Red, right? But you're, it's your name on on you know uh, as the author of the node, right? But there are a lot of contributors, right? We have all seen in the in in the Node Package Manager, lots of nodes come and go. We've seen yeah. them started and then no one they people stop maintaining them. 
what do you say to people who say, okay, right now I've got an OPC UA node that I can use and it works and it works with the current version, but how can I be assured that that, that node is going to be maintained over time if I'm going to put that in production? How, how do you, cause that is, that's a question I'm going to get. I'm not going to get that from the customer. You know, the client directly mm -hmm. probably isn't even going to know that's a risk, but someone within IT, some, some system architect is going to know that's a risk and they're going to ask the question, how do you answer that question? I think really that, um, successful open source tools show exactly what we have to do. And that is community maintenance at the end. So that community works that we have the dev developers, not just me or Mika, Karaya, they really make some pressure on the project so that you have maybe 10 or 15 people making pressure to get new releases, to get the next best version for, let's say, especially OPC UA rolling updates, what we have now, um, where we have also some security issues to solve. Um, a lot of um, tech stack also, which is a big tech stack in OPC UA, um, also with PubSub, um, where we see why, why uh, Etienne reacts this way to say, hey, PubSub is closed now because nobody uh, or not nobody i think you get some support from the industry but uh, um, it could be more and especially from from um, uh, creative and, and powerful um, young developers they go into the project uh, show that they are really trustful as a community and that they want to bring it further because that that is really a, a key part for um, the maintenance of packages as we see also on modbus we want to to keep it right and the best package but it's a lot of things what we also do and um you know, if you have not the time and uh, not a big community and interesting was here what i learned over the last eight years a lot of people don't contribute because they say hey you earn money with this <laughs> but Ooh. i say no no never so i get maybe over eight years i got 1000 euro or so together uh what i get paid for uh modbus let's say huh so because the software is what we thought we want to show how to make a really quality, high quality package for Node-RED so that other developers can have a look to our package and see how can we use uh, continuous integration, how can we use testing, etc. Because that makes quality what we need in the contribution packages. Um, that was more the idea. And maybe the quality of the package is then bringing people to think, oh, they have to be paid for it. <laughs> But we didn't. Who, we just who owns who owns? So let's say Klaus tomorrow you decide, you know what, I don't want to maintain this anymore. I don't want to be the author of it anymore. Mm -hmm. How does how is ownership transferred and to most... responsibility? How is responsibility? Let's put it that way. How is responsibility transferred? And then Oriol, I want to go to you on the how do you yeah. overcome the Correct. it's it's production ready question. But Klaus, how how, how is responsibility for a node transferred if Klaus Lansdorf tomorrow decides I, I don't want to maintain this anymore. I don't want to lead the maintenance of it anymore. Yeah. So there's one point. Um, we can just let it open source. And uh, the way also for the NPM is really great in that because we had it also. We asked for a package and said, hey, nobody maintains the package over a year. What can we do with the package? And they said, hey, please, there's an email. Ask the author if they want to get your contributions, your a pull request, whatever, to bring it in the software. And if they don't do, then we are open to hand over the package to you. And that's yeah. really a great opportunity in open source to say, hey, we really want to take care about this package and the community can take it over. And uh, and that's, so it's never lost, let's say. You know, we had also the point where I was really angry because somebody, in a, it was really a bad day for me. And, uh, and at that day, somebody called me on my private phone and said, hey, you have to, to, to fix this. Hey, did you see the issue that I gave you on GitHub? Hey, hey, did you hear me? I have a customer. I, it has to work tomorrow. Now, do it. Do it. And I really screamed on the phone and said, hey, are you crazy? It's open source. Just do it. Go to the code. Send me pull requests. I will implement it. I will make the release. That's it. Um, pretty crazy story. And that was the point to say, okay, I'm making my master thesis at the moment. I stopped this, really <laughs> took the code off from GitHub because people were going crazy in that time. It's also what we see in Node-RED. Every two or three years, we have a period like Bitcoin. So <laughs> yeah. Node-RED is the new uh, gold rush. Um, 
situation. <clears throat> yeah, and that, that is the story behind. Uh, and there it was really hard maybe for people to get to our code. But if they had asked us, uh, it was also the point to say, we can give the code to you. By the way, I've modified it. I've modified it significantly in testing environments to, you know, um, I've never made a pull request saying, I think you should incorporate my changes, but I have modified it significantly. I mean, I, for me, I, I default to, I'll just go ahead and take the code and modify spe specifically how browsing is handled in the node. For example, I, it was how I, I personally modified it, but Oriel on the production ready piece, how do you overcome that objection? Yeah. I, I want to talk about an anecdotal thing, sort of how it drove home my realization that node run is, is ready for production, but yeah, yeah, completely, completely agree. Yeah. This question, uh, appears once and again in, in the conversations. Okay. But uh, the first thing that I recap with them, it is, what's the alternative? The alternative is go to a proprietary com appliance or a proprietary uh, application where I have no chance to overpass whatever problem that I have. And usually it's quite complicated to find the proper person for receiving the, the necessary support. I mean, uh, I have two, three fun situations that I lived with IBM and Siemens. I lost projects with in front of them. Okay. And the afternoon after the meeting, I received a call from them saying, can you set up what we want this morning in front of you? I say, what? You, you won. Why do I have to do that for you? Because we don't have engineers for doing what we sold. Yeah. Oh, but by the way, we say this all the time. I, I'm, I'm okay. very... Oh, then smoke. overpass that. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. What's the idea? What's the idea? What I'm trying to say, it is from one side, the alternative is not very good. The other thing, as Klaus already said, is yes, maybe you are not, uh, you don't have the skills for uh, using that uh, uh, that code and do whatever or fixing whatever is not working good enough in this project for you. Yes, but you have integrators. And this is where you put your uh, your commitment, where where with who you are uh, confident, okay? So you have to be confident in people who can give you solutions in whatever integration or in whatever uh, project that you are working with. So makes sense what I'm saying? But yes. it's the idea it is, if I am uh, contracting a company for doing whatever project in my company, and the only thing that they can do is just uh, configuring some pieces, maybe they don't really know what they are doing. They're just configuring some pieces. And I think, uh, and, and they already know that it's not enough. Because of that, they started learning programming Visual Basic a, a long time ago, okay? Because it's not enough with the typical automation tools for solving the, the issues that we have in manufacturing. Then uh, this is just another way of, follow, of following that. So uh, do you ask if C or C++ or Python it's uh, good enough or production ready. Why don't you ask that? It's exactly the same question. You are mm -hmm. comparing no red with, uh, I don't know, whatever IoT gateway that you can buy in a, in a, in a, pro, in a price list. And you have to compare that with Python. Right. I mean, yeah. it's a programming language. It's a framework that allows you to develop solutions. Instead of programming with raw code, you can program in flow programming. It's another way of thinking fast way of solving issues that you have in front and easy to maintain as i said before so how can it how can the discussion be focused on the programming language the discussion it's, has to be focused on the solution is your are your primary focuses so class what do you class what do you do for a living so if you don't make money doing this what where do you make your money how do you pay your bills um, yeah, we really solved problems at the end. So, and uh, what we had really was also working with Node-RED with our experience at the end, because we really know how it works inside. We also contributed to Node-RED uh, directly because uh, if you see well, the you're one- selling, You're getting check, paid on the service side as opposed the service, to- the product again, side. Exactly, You're getting yeah, paid on the service open side. Open source works at the end. So the open source is, is for free. And, uh, but we learned that this, is, uh, this idea is not working. We know also that uh, companies, because we, we also work with a lot of the big companies together, but every yeah. time for free because he said, hey, it's open source. And if we pay you, then we have some problems with licenses and agreements and blah, blah, blah. 
<clears throat> okay, then we said, okay, and then just the servers to make a prototype flow or whatever to see really how it works to work with the device together in the workshop, whatever it is um, at the end. But uh, really the software development is also what we tr uh, saw. Uh, we had people, they, they closed up their, let's say, contribution to the package. We had one uh, student, they called us and said, hey, I have a great com uh, documentation for the IAT OPCUA package, but I have some details what I don't understand. Can you answer me the question? I said, okay, I want, don't want to be paid. Just give me the documentation so that we share, our, um, can check that we share it and I give you all the details you want to have. And they said, no, that's our market, um, you know, let's say uh, pro, so we don't want to share it. And I said, okay, then I don't want to help you. <laughs> That's open source <laughs> that we give some back at the end. And, and what yeah. we uh, also learned for plus for Red at the end, what we do today is we make it to um, uh, do a license at the end where we say um, pay it or contribute. That's the idea. So that means it's really fair to say either for, either for, provide la either provide labor to support the further development or pay for a license. Test. It could be documentation. It could be just discussing whatever it is. Uh, that's the idea I have. Uh, I really want a, um, a lawyer. Lawyer is it the right word? Yeah, to make attorney. A license, uh, really a new license, because I go uh, to say, hey, I have a problem. Everybody wants to have open source in the industry, but nobody wants to pay for it because that's a problem. <clears throat> then it has to be open as this GPL version 3 or something like this. Right. That everybody has to go to open again. But this also doesn't work for the industry because the industry cannot make all open what they do on top. And also for us, it could be interesting to get these tools at the end to solve problems in real projects where we earn our money at the end. So I asked, I talked to him because it's, he is really also an author um, of you know, bigger licenses for open source. And uh, he said, okay, I love your idea. It's really great. Everybody can contribute. And if they contribute in one year, to your project, they are a member of your license and they can use it for free. For so, one year? Mm -hmm. For one year or in Every perpetuity? Year we have a look, um, do they contribute or uh, do they just use it and uh, don't uh, give something back to the community? And the idea is also to have just a B2B community at the end, make maintenance. Okay. And it's it's not the difference if you make some tests, if you write some documentation, as I said, if you give a piece of code or just make an issue, hey, there's a problem, I have some description here. Here's a hardware device to test. Right, that's contributing. That's contributing. Really right? compu yeah, really uh, yeah. contributing as, as a community. And that's what is the biggest story. challenge for you, Klaus? <clears throat> what is the biggest challenge? Well, actually, to, let me go back here. Let's let's a ask, answer this question first. For the audience, the term open source gets thrown around all the time. OK, and I think a lot of people misunderstand what open source actually means. OK, so let's start by defining what open source is. OK, so open source is software where you can see the raw code behind it. And if and in general, depending upon which license it is, is licensed under, if you make any changes to it, you have to report back those changes. The own the author of that open source software can decide whether or not to incorporate it, incorporate it. But in general, they want to see how you changed it and they may want to incorporate the changes that you implemented, they may not want to incorporate them. Maybe they create a different branch and it becomes a completely different product, but that's generally open source. Anybody can view the code. Anybody can change the code as they see fit, but the author of the open source software is the one who's really controlling how the, the core be, gets changed and gets delivered to the open source community. What are the biggest challenges Obviously, in open source, there is a really there's a fine line between, um, you know, how you commercialize open source. There's a really how do I how do we make money off of the labor that goes into writing open source software, right? Because there's a very, very fine line about where you're allowed to make money and where you're not allowed to make money. Otherwise, it's no longer you know open source. So. What are the biggest challenges in working in the open source world? And by the way, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I, I, I'm segueing into another question. But what are the biggest challenges for you guys? I mean, Oriole, you're, you know, Nexion is is a is purely private software, intellectual property, right? You have what is it? I I I don't remember the name of the platform, but it, it's M I I. Mimetic. 
you mean right? mimetic yeah yeah that that is not open source that's owned by no. right that's but, proprietary software and then klaus operates in the open source world what is the biggest challenges in the open source world so what are the big uh, uh, getting contributors obviously would be one right but it, you've touched on a couple of them where i see all the time in the open source world which is you know everybody wants everything to be free until it costs them something right yeah and then yeah yeah you know, so Klaus, what are what are the biggest challenges for you in the open source world? Yeah, exactly this, that it's really hard to build a community at the end. Um, so you need somebody they, they, that they re or some people, they really do nothing else than just uh, maintaining. Right. That was, was also the success, I think, of tools like Node Red because they had a really great community from the very beginning because the people love what, it, what they saw. Also, technicians could... Uh, really go into this, not just software developers. So that means, and that's also what I really love on, on these tools because it's not splitting OT and IT world that really brings it together. Um, that also technical, which some, which has just some JavaScript understanding can provide me the idea. <laughs> so, and I can make better software from it as a software developer also. And so, so I think it really needs uh, for open source these point. Uh, to, to build a community with people together. Can people, can people develop nodes for Node Red that they sell, that they take to market and sell, right? It's normally yeah, you, really easy. But this, yeah, you, but, you, you can, but, but by the end, uh, in theory, in theory, okay, uh, you cannot hide the code right. in theory. Okay, in practice, you know, everything can be hacked. Okay, but in theory, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to hide the code. And then uh, when you commercialize that, the difficulty will be control the number of licenses that you sh have sold. No? Because Node, yeah. Red, Node Red by default wasn't built to be able to manage like, you know, it doesn't have a concept of multi-tenant licensing or, yeah. or no individual node light. It doesn't have a concept for. Correct. So it also it wasn't concerned with obfuscation of the raw code that that you use to build a node. Um, and so obviously that becomes problematic, right? But but in theory, you can sell your node. You can write a node and you can sell it to the market. Can, if you have a commercial node available, can, can people still download it using Node Package Manager or do you generally have to go get that from the person selling it, right? Or uh, do you see scenarios where there are commercial nodes available through NPM? Yes. Mm. Yes. So it's normally it's a, there's a catalog in Node Red. You can extend the catalog so that your customers really see the packages in the list, uh, like they ever see other packages. Also, you can Got also it. change yeah. the catalog that they just see your packages and nothing else. That's also a way yeah. to go. Yeah. With. And uh, also, you can work with yeah. the npm rc. What we do for Flowforge at the moment to yeah. to, to yeah. go this way. By, uh, by the way, important yeah. to notice about that. Okay. You, you have a catalog, but not a marketplace. So the management of the license and the control of payments and ETC has to be managed by yourself. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. it's important. Eh? So you can extend the catalog, but not a marketplace. There is no marketplace. Eh? So let me let me let me say this, and let's see if you guys agree. Here's here's my position on software in industry. Okay, um, so a couple of things, Klaus. I'm incredibly hard on the OPC Foundation. You know, Stefan Hop has emailed me two Sorry. dozen <laughs> yes Stefan. we know that we know so i let me say this i love opc ua as a standard i love opc ua i i am very disappointed with part 14 pub sub i would i would like part 14 to just be rewritten from scratch and so that we see wider adoption i think you 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 lightly touched on this that mm -hmm. while there's a standard for pub sub we do not see wide adoption of pub sub across the industry and there's a guy who's a member of our community he works for general electric hire he's a engineer his name is matthew paris i don't know if you've read matthew's paper but he wrote a he wrote a paper um that was basically a, a, a you know a criticism of it was an mm -hmm. open letter to opc the opc yeah. foundation let me say this. I, I am very hard on the OPC Foundation, but OPC UA has been invaluable to our industry. Okay. Uh, OPC DA was invaluable to our industry, and OPC UA is invaluable to our industry. That being said, 
I do see it as problematic at scale in many types of architectures that we work with. This is why I'm so high on MQTT. OPC UA would, I think, would be much more valuable if, if pub sub was the rule rather than the exception, right? It would be mm -hmm. much more valuable in enterprise architectures if pub sub was the rule instead of the exception. Okay, that being said, um, the future of software, okay, it, in industry, I see it is open that the the money you make is not from the labor selling my labor of initially developing software and then in the future maintaining it over time my customers are paying me 18 percent per year to maintain it on their license i don't see that as the future what i see is is the future is in the service component that software is a way of landing you know if i'm klaus landsdorf right so let's say i'm klaus and I'm the author of the OPC UA node um, at Node Red. My, I'm going to make my money by leading the service organization that integrates through that node using Node Red across the world. I, I mean, I would have hundreds of engineers who are learned, who have been taught by me on how to integrate using that node in Node Red all across manufacturing. That's where the that's where the money is. Right, that that's where you're gonna to me, but uh, at the end, it's more. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I had also to do my math thesis in that time where I developed it. I had no time for developing a business in that time, but also that was not the idea. Um, because I had also in that time, really early, um, since also my bachelor thesis, my master thesis, all these uh, stuff shows what I think about OPCUA and how to bring really industry, industry 4.0 as the idea to be open, and that means, um, um, also for OPC UA, it could be a really great technology if there would not be so many problems with money. I, I understand Stefan Hoppe that he says, hey, there's something to pay. We go to fair trades and whatever, blah, blah, blah. We need that money to bring OPC UA further. That's, that's one point of this. But if uh, it gets successfully, you could really uh, observe that it gets more and more uh, like also pops up is now it's much too expensive. It's just a bit MQTT on the protocol. Jason was existing in the description. Yes. So I, as a developer, say, where's the Why problem? Don't just... Why you oh. don't just push out Jason? I could put it on an MQTT broker. Then you get a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's not industry, blah, blah, blah. And you need a lot of uh, uh, yeah, um, checks and whatever should be secure. But for me as a software developer, so why? You can also send XML. Right. So where's B, the B2 MLL? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. they, they it, there, it, there's no difference, right? It, it, Oriel, let me ask you this. Actually, both of you, you know, the, we have a conversation about MQTT and OPC UA all the time. And my position is OPC UA is very, very valuable at level one and level two, L1 and L2. Incredibly valuable for unlocking data in devices. But then we recommend building digital infrastructure based on pub sub. So specifically... MQTT is what we're using 90% of the time. Sometimes we're using AMQP. Sometimes we're using DMP3. Sometimes we're using other protocols. But for the most part, we're using MQTT, right? We have a relationship with Arlen Nipper. You know, Andy Stanford Clark and IBM are still very close to developing MQTT. So it's not going anywhere, right? Um, our position is OPC UA belongs on the edge. But then you have folks like Eric Barnstadt, right? Who uh, Eric is, uh, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant guy his position is all things opc ua that's his position right o opc yeah. needs to be the digital infrastructure where do you guys stand are you more in the hybrid like there's a place for both mqtt and opc ua in digital infrastructure for enterprises or it's one versus the other uh, i completely agree with your idea walker about l1 and l2 uh, what i mean it is in the past or uh, let me say not only in the past I already see nowadays uh, people who uh, set up architectures with Modbus. And I say, yeah. come on, what yeah. happened? Yeah. In what kind of hole are you hitting? No, yeah. it <laughs> makes no sense. No, but they already already do that. And the, and the answer is, we did that for 30 years. We're not going to change. You say, yeah, that's okay. But 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 makes no sense where you cannot put security when you are going to connect that to the cloud. What my mind explodes when I see that. Okay. Right. So yeah. I see the future that maybe, maybe OPC UA 
can substitute that mod boost tendency or that trend in those levels, L1, L2. But uh, when I set up edges, I put always in the edge uh, MQTT broker, always. There is no yeah. exception. The worst case, it is where the MQTT, uh, let me say, exchange data inside the same edge. But just because of that makes sense to, to, to have that there. Are you putting a, an MQTT broker on the same device you've got Node-RED running on? If right, I can, can, yes. Right, you got them if on I edge can, yes. device, you got them running together. Correct. Yeah, a simple PC, you know, embedded embedded PC, and, and, and it's good enough for running both cases. Of course, there are cases where you have to have a, a cluster much more complicated because they want HA. Yeah, there are many solutions about that. Maybe this is not the forum for talking about that, but but there is there are many solutions about that if you need. Anyway, the idea is after that, as you already said, worker, in the cloud, I see uh, AMQP, AC Kafka. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe in some cases where I have a fleet, a big fleet around the world exchanging data, maybe I can have MQTT on, on that cloud, or maybe I have a uh, co-op, you know, how, how yeah. do you pronounce co-op in English? It's this way, co-op? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't know how to pronounce that. Yep. Then in co-op, for instance, I have a, a customer with 16,000 uh, fridges around the world connected with co-op and narrow ban IoT. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Then yeah. in that case, in the cases where the fridges are not connecting with narrow ban IoT, they use MQTT directly. And then I have in this case MQTT and co-op and later AMQP. So everything so is normalized to AMQP. Here is a here is a in, by in for those of you that don't know really the you know, AMQP is is Microsoft's messaging is is is, is Microsoft's MQTT. Different protocols, but they look very very similar. AMQP is actually has much more features in the specification than MQTT does. So one of the complaints about MQTT is there are no methods, right? You there are no methods on a topic in MQTT. It's one of my big. It's one of the things I love about OPC UA is that we can put a method on a on an item inside of the OPC UA inside of an OPC UA structure. You can't put there are no methods in MQTT. You can write an external one that's going to run mm -hmm. if that topic changes, but it it doesn't run as part of the specification. AMQP has those types of features. OPC UA has those types of features. One one of the things that we've been doing lately is I've been looking at what if I did just a purely open source infrastructure? So that is, because I'm gonna ask you guys the question as we close out here, where does open source end and where does I, you know, intellectual property begin? For the average manufacturer, who that's our primary audience, where should they be putting open source, right? And so I've been testing the complete open source infrastructure. So using EMQX Community Edition, which is, which is, mm -hmm. Un, no, no license using portainer to deploy all my my apache nifi and apache kafka uh containers so i've got those at l3 and l4 then i'm deploying node red containers at l1 and l2 through portainer and i want to i want to talk about this question with you klaus where you know where do i use portainer where do i use flowforge which is flowforge is a tool for managing you know um enterprise class deployments of node red you know, um, all across an organization. Yeah. So I've been testing this open source strategy. Could mm -hmm. I really put open source everywhere? Have the entire enterprise infrastructure be open source? For and me, the answer yeah. is <laughs> yes, you could definitely do it. I mean, yes. not only yes. could you do it, you're probably better off. You're probably yep. better off doing it, right? But I so, think also with the tool like Portano, um, it's, it's uh, the, especially the, also the idea from this tool, like Node-RED, it also had, to bring that technology like Docker to people, they are not experienced with all these features and CLI programming, terminals, whatever, blah, right. blah, blah, but you really have a UI, which is human understandable, which really can hide some advanced features at the very beginning so that you really can start with easy to use step-by-step -step integration for you. And uh, especially, and that is what I would have as a um, perspective for the future, if we get, let's say, a great Docker Compose library or, or great stacks like uh, Portainer also provides at the very beginning that you have some app templates. But if open source community could concentrate on providing those um, templates, then it gets more and more easier 
to use um, open source because I don't have to you to know about the complexity. It gets starting complexity hiding, and that's also um, <clears throat> what Portainer is, what Flowforge is, because also Flowforge is a tool to make all these work for you uh, to create the Docker container and to run up a SSL certification, blah blah blah. So you don't take take care about this. You just start it up yes. and boom, now can use it. And that's the idea of the future that uh, we as developers, especially as innovative in developers in open source, loving the idea of industrial um, IoT and industry 4.0, is really to provide with great templates, with easy to use, and let's say uh, one touch onboarding like this. Right, right. You call it, we, we, I used to say, when people would ask me, what is Node-RED? I would say, it is a, it's a UI for bringing JavaScript to the masses. That's how yeah. I used to describe it, right? It's the UI <laughs> for bringing JavaScript to the masses. Node That's JS all. Not just JavaScript, really also Node.js is a really big framework where you have a lot of things that you can do with file IO, network IO, right. blah, blah, blah. Oh, and that's really, really. Um, well, one of my biggest complaints about Kafka, Apache Kafka is no UI out of the box. And you think, <laughs> and if you look, there are so many people who defer to Apache NiFi, which has a GUI out of the box. Yeah, but can't handle the scale that Kafka can, right? It can't handle, doesn't handle streaming data the way Kafka can. And mm -hmm. people will try to use NiFi for solutions that they should be using Kafka for. And the only reason they're not using Kafka is because they don't want to deal with the yeah. command, command line components of correct. it, right? I mean, yeah, that correct. you cannot, un you can't overstate the value of a drag and drop GUI, right? I mean, you cannot mm -hmm. overstate the value, no, which is no. why, right? The, the, so let's let's go here, which is you know this discussion. Where do you see open source ending, and and proprietary commercial software beginning? Like a really common architecture. You know, over here I have this board. I have a a board that has PLCs all over it. It's my demo board. Mm -hmm. It's you know I've got S seven. I've got Rockwell. I've got everything on it. Right. I've got my demo board, and somebody had asked me. Could you build a uh, edge of network device that did these four things? Number one, it created a unified namespace on the board for so convert all those protocols into their semantic hierarchy and create one unified namespace. Number two, you have a free and open historian. Number three, you have a graphical component for the time series an analysis of the data. And number four, you have a data ops platform. So that is, I can manipulate the data on the edge. And so I was prototyping using Raspberry Pi, running Mosquito, Node-RED, um, uh, InfluxDB, and Grafana, right? That would get mm -hmm. me yeah. all, all open source, all those things. Correct. And I originally thought I would just prototype it and that I would harden it using, and that thing's been running for three and a half years now. Yeah. Right, same yeah. The only yeah. thing that's changed is the size of the SD card so that I can store more history. That's it. Right? Yeah. So the question yeah. is, clearly that's production ready. I could go and use that same stack, maybe put it in an Advantech Uno, something that's rated for higher temperatures or whatever, but you know, maybe not a Raspberry Pi. But where does open source end and proprietary begin? Because that data, by the way, it goes, it goes from the Mosquito broker and then it goes up into an EMQX broker. Then I have the Ignition platform talking to it on one side and I have WinCCOA talking to it on the other side, right? So I've got two different proprietary yeah. commercial softwares. Correct. In your opinion, Oriel, we'll go with you first. Where does the open source end and commercial begin? For the average yeah. organization. Yeah, yeah, for the average. Yeah, important thing to, to say before everything. It is I'm here thanks to open source. This is very, yeah. very, very, very important, okay? Because I'm not rich. And as I said, I started when I was nine. So when I was 14, I uh, installed Unix uh, System 5. Then two years later, I had the chance to install Linux. It was 1991, <laughs> okay? Uh, okay? Yeah, so if I didn't have the chance to use open source for 20 plus years, I didn't have the chance to learn 1% of the things that I had the chance to learn. So right. I, I, uh, first thing to say is open source, it's completely necessary for learning. So when you don't have a budget, how you are going to learn if you cannot pay the licenses and not 
all companies have a uh, student's license. Okay, let me say, first thing said. Uh, secondly, important thing, uh, I don't see in near future, neither in mid long term, uh, hardware manufacturers are going to open the firmware. So the firmware, in my opinion, keeps going, it will keep being uh, private, it keep being not open source. Okay? okay. And then in the other extreme, when I see, let me say, the applications next to the user, okay? For instance, Grafana, let me say this way, okay? Yes, Grafana yep. is super nice and, and, and cool tool. Yeah, but there are plenty of competitors that are not open source and they put the things really difficult, especially in companies. For instance, Power BI. Right. So when you are in, yep. in company side, it's really difficult to defend Grafana because they have they already have Grafana. I sorry, they already have uh, Power BI or maybe other tools from Oracle or other companies, and it's quite difficult to compete with those tools. By the right. way, when you don't have budget, you have Grafana, which is more than excellent. Okay, yep. good. Then where I see open source in the middle, in the middle. So that's the most important place. Yeah. So the so the Correct. data is open. Completely so the data agree. is open. Right. Correctly. Completely agree. Yeah. And and if you wanna if you wanna get the rule, I think this is network, where you have network, whatever kind of network, field bus, uh, internet, private network whatever kind of network that you have, it's quite important to have open source there because right. network means interoperability. interoperability. Right. In interoperability with proprietary code, it's impossible. But, but, but by the way, Klaus, when it comes to the OPC, I want to come back to the OPC thing. OPC UA was defined to, to be the, def the standard for interoperability in industrial data. And while I believe that is the OPC Foundation's goal, their primary mandate, and that's what they work towards, in practice, it doesn't work out that way, primarily because so much of the standard is optional. That's the biggest issue. So when somebody says OPC ready, OPC ready, I could have two OPC products that, that have the OPC logo on them, and they don't even talk to each other because they're completely different implementations of different features of OPC. You know what I mean? Like if I, if, if, if this, feature is is producing an information model okay that mm. i can't consume because i wasn't required to put in a parser for that information model they don't talk to each other right i mean it's literally you know and, and that's one of my biggest complaints about the the opc foundation is that if i see opc on the box it should mean i have interoperability but what it means is if i've implemented that part of, if we've implemented the same part of the specification then we have interoperability. But let me go back to you, Klaus, which is, in your opinion, where does open end, and I, I like Oriel's description there, but where do, in your opinion, where does open end and, and you're obviously an open source guy, but their customers are gonna need commercial solutions in some cases. Where are the places where it's appropriate to be commercial and where is it where you should definitely remain, you should stay open? For me, it's really um, the point, um, maybe there are two perspectives one perspective is uh, for the product or for the tools at the end their uh, open source really ends if it starts to to be interesting for a lot of people because most time then uh, it starts that people want to earn money from it and don't mm -hmm. to to keep it in the middle um, so that is a point what i love on protein or protein i have the ce version where it's really open source you can go into you can contribute and afterwards could also be in the in the business edition um, so they have to be a business edition because also there, from my experience, but I know it, is a, you can look also maybe on the commits. There are not so many contributors. There's not a not a big community, and that means uh, open source ends in that point where I no not have a great community. So maybe I have Modbus for Node Red, yes, but in real uh, important projects we have also Softing where we say, hey, we bring in that proprietary license at the end because we know in ten years that will work also and that we have somebody if it is to maintain from a change, whatever it is, uh, because uh, you don't have just um, the feature at the end because people are talking mostly just about features, but we have also government. That means in the cyber war, what we have at the moment um, over the planet could be that the government goes more and more deeper in IT. And if they say, hey, you have to bring in TLS or whatever to secure your communication, your data, what's then? What do you do? 
do you find the community to do that in your open source? So it's really a more um, a community and also I think power to the people thing, you know, because if people think on one hand, I don't want to give my money because that guy earns money from the tool, blah, blah. So I don't want to give my money because I want to keep it for just me. So we know a lot of people, they have different thinking um, about this. But if you think as a community to say, hey, what what if we have one package for Modbus, which is, let's say, also um, getting some stars or what's the, um, the word in English when you make some recommendations or so that you can give a star. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. the idea yeah. was also what I... Ranking. A ranking, ranking yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Because I discussed with uh, Nick from the core team of Nobred, what if we can have two rankings, one from the community and one from the industry? Right. That would help us mm. in Nobred first to see, is that package a great package to install it? In my case, because I, if I... I like the, this, this is what Rotten Tomatoes does. So, you know, Rotten Tomatoes, they rank movies, right? So Rotten Tomatoes does two. They have the critics ranking, and then they have the audience score. And I never listen to the critics. I always listen <laughs> to what the audience says. I, yeah. So the, the critic may score a movie very high, but the audience yeah. hated it. I'm, I'm yeah. not, I don't listen to the critic. I, I listen to what the audience says. I like that idea a lot. My, the ranking I would care about is the integrator's ranking, the, 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 right. the consumer, also, the, the, their hmm. ranking. Because yeah, they, yeah. they have different use cases at the end also. Yeah? And then that is really where you have sometimes really to use in a project, the proprietary software, um, because you have a better team, maybe let's say 10 people or 15 people, they're taking care about the technology. And especially if it is a rolling update, then you need maybe every year an update for this. And if you don't have a great community for that in open source, there's the question answered for me. I, I've got, I've got, I'm going to, say where 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 my opinion is okay so digital transformation for organizations you know it basically happens in two giant steps right giant step number one is that first three to five years where they become a smart company and that is becoming connected to all their data putting it in one place learning from it right that's step one you know visualizing it just getting raw getting data and information into the hands of people who need it when they need it where they need it the smartphone for the smart factory. That's step one. Step two is plugging into the digital supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. And the first, the, the when I'm trying to become a smart company, what I'm doing is I'm connecting to data, I'm collecting it, I'm storing it, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I'm analyzing it, and then I'm visualizing it, and then I'm trying mm -hmm. to find patterns in that data, then I'm looking for problems, and then I'm reporting what those problems are. That's that first. I believe open source is connect collect store it should always that should be open source that should be open architecture connect collect store should be open okay mm -hmm. the yeah. an analysis where i think commercial should start is on the analysis side that you, you it, it could be open but you could also commercialize the conversion yes. of that data into aggregated value right that's what i i tell people but i i think where most organizations make a mistake is they try to buy connect collect store and yeah. then what they've done is they've given ownership of their infrastructure to a commercial organization, right? They've literally transferred ownership, right? And and I believe that that's where you need to be open architecture and you need to be open source at the connect collect store. That following up, I was just thinking about this. Klaus, any plans to implement part 14 pub sub in a, in a node? In, in in node red yes we're talking with Etienne about this um okay the problem is really that it's not open um it's really also the point what i kind of understand as i said said in the beginning of this meeting um so also here um if maybe the community would say uh these um you know, stack what you said or the ming stack at the end also like um where we collect data uh also can make connectivity at the end um, it's really the point where I could say, what if we all try to do this one tool, which is really great, which implements the whole protocol stack, with really each feature which is existing right. in the specification. The that would be really interesting uh, in tools like Node-RED because technicians can work with this, software developers can do this, ITOT come together in that communication over code is existing in the tool. And uh, we can really go with Git and all these stuff, make our versioning uh, long-term support, uh, et cetera. 
So, um, yeah. One of the biggest challenges we have, what a lot of people in our community do, if we're using OPC UA at level one and level two, is you'll be using like an OPC server, say Kep server or something. And, and, and what we, what the first thing everyone's doing is they're connecting to that server using some open tool. So whether they're using your node in node red, or they're using say the, uh, Py the Python library for browsing OPC UA, that open uh, source Python library. And the first thing they're doing is they're scanning the namespace, the OPC server namespace. They're, they're, su they're subscribing to all the items. And then what they're doing is they're converting the, that, that the name, the path, the OPC item path to a MQTT topical namespace. And then they're publishing it to an MQTT broker. Here are a couple of the problems with that. Number one, they have to continually scan the OPC server namespace for any changes. So I've added in new items or whatever. That's number one. And number two, the subscriptions are not very robust in that library. Like you, you'll lose a subscription quite a bit or, you know, because if, if the update happens at a point where you're not, where you're not actually at the point of the scan in the code, then you're going to miss the update, right? You'll, you'll get the next one. One of the things that we really need is the ability we need that to be much more robust. We need to be able to convert an OPC server namespace into an MQTT topical namespace much easier. Part 14 was designed to do that, right? So the, the question is, how confident are you that we could, that we, we will eventually see a very useful implement, implementation of part 14, maybe, maybe in Node-RED? I, I, by the way, I know the more I think about it, I'm like JavaScript's blister, blistering fast. It's, it's like, that just seems so appropriate, right? That that's where it should be. What do you think the likelihood is that we're going to see it there? Um, yeah, from my perspective, hopefully this or next year, um, because oh, we are really interested in that. I discussed with my trainee about this, um, because he's really experienced now with OPC UA and learned all the, the pros and cons, let's say, yeah. about it. Uh, and he said the first time he had a look to uh, pops up, said, why to do it this way? Because you have to send some <laughs> OPC UA binary yeah. stuff through MQTT. Yeah. He said, why Why should we do that this way? Don't just having the... Uh, the, 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 the assumption, the assumption is the consumer, whatever. The, ups, the assumption is the consumer is an OPC UA client. That's why. Yeah. The, assume, yeah. the assumption is, is on the, uh, on the consuming end, it, you, it opens the way. Yeah. But pops up with a message broker? It's What's that? Pretty... No, what uh, OPC UA use pops up, yeah. But without yes. the message broker. Without the message broker, yeah. Why do you want pops up just solving part of the problem, not the real problem, which is right. interchanging the information with a quite amount of unknown parts? Mm -hmm. well, we're, we're, let's take it home here because I know we're a couple minutes over. Here it is. Here's the the, the ultimate question. I, I I hate that we didn't get to the Portainer um, the Flowforge piece, but um, we'll save it for maybe I'll invite you guys back. Well, actually, I definitely will invite you guys back. I would love to have this conversation uh, further, a deeper dive on this. But where do you guys see, what does the next 24 months look like? What are you most looking forward to? You know, with what you're working on, Klaus, which what you're working on, Oriel, what are you most looking forward to over the, say, the next 24 months in our industry? Is there, are there any exciting developments? What are the exciting developments that you're most looking forward to? And we'll go with Oriel first and then have Klaus take yeah. us home. I'm going to be short. At the, at the end, uh, you already talked about that with a lot of podcasts or uh, publications that you have in YouTube. Uh, in the end, it's, for me, it's universal namespace. It's the next step in all that stuff. I mean, we need tools that really talk about that. Mm -hmm. For instance, last week I've seen a webinar from HiveMQ talking about that stuff. That, that's okay, but it's not com the complete picture. It's just a blurry thing that, yeah, maybe it's a kind of unified, but we need something if it can be open source better, no? But at the end, uh, we need a tool for creating and maintaining our UNS. And then as uh, another tool for, for historian, no? Uh, how do I solve that nowadays? It is with Node-RED, <laughs> with InfluxDB and MongoDB. Yes. With those three tools, I solve that triangle, okay? Uh, in the edge and in the cloud. So it is a kind of federation. 
So it is a part of the complete picture, and then it reports to the central point. For instance, I have factories with, with, where I have, for instance, 70 or 80 islands of IoT gateways that report and federate to the central point, just as a summary. What, I, what I'm most excited about are, I believe, Highbyte and another tool called Maestro Hub, which is being developed oh, in Turkey. Yeah. Right? So right. I, I am most excited about where Highbyte and Maestro Hub are going. And I believe yeah. that they both could potentially be the tools to do just that. The, correct, correct. The management tool for a unified name. And, and Highbyte is what we use all the time. It's crazy that they're only three years old and, and they're at the point where they are at this point. It's you know, amazing. It's amazing. Right? It really is. I have to and, congratulate you know, them. I have to congratulate them. Yeah, Aaron Semley, who is their CTO there, is just, he's a freak of nature. I don't know how he has developed as much as he has in the last three years. So Highbyte and Maestro Hub, those tools, two tools, I believe are what you're talking about, but it, that's what I'm most excited about over the next two years. As it relates to MQTT, I'm, I've been invited to Germany next month. I'm going uh, the 13th through the 16th, I think. It's during some festival in Bavaria. The, I think it's the Prince's Wedding or something. But anyway, Hive MQ is putting on the MQTT Expert Summit. And Andy Stanford Clark from IBM is going to be there. There is a big, it's like a, a big discussion about the future of MQTT, right? And what needs to be, and my, my whole goal there is to talk about primarily two things. Number one, microservice support, right? The, with, with the standard, you need microservice support and we need method support in MQTT. Got to have both. You know, it's one of the most valuable things in OPC UA are methods on topics in the OPC standard. Yeah. Let, but, let me add something very fast about what you said, Walker. Just uh, because we talk about uh, MQTT and OPC UA, and we forget to mention Spark Plug B, oh, which great. is, uh, which is, I think we cannot compare MQTT with with OPC UA. We have to compare Spark Plug B with uh, OPC UA. It's my opinion. And so I should say MQTT, Spark Plug B, and OPC UA. I should normally I qualify it. I didn't there. You're absolutely correct, Oriel. Uh, Klaus. What are you most excited about the next two years? The next two years, I'm you know, try really to go with the plus one with red idea with this B2B community to make uh, you know, Node Red and also Flowforge more, more stable. That's why we have this partnership now with Flowforge. I'm talking to the core team as, uh, you know, as, as how, you know, in that time when it is possible. It was not so often at the moment, but uh, I hope it gets more and more in discussion because they have great ideas. They make a great job also. And we try as a company uh, here also in Yeshmia tries also to do the part of um, yeah, creating open source stuff. And I think with the trainee, I will really go deeper with that <laughs> pops up idea what we have, how it should work for us. Uh, this was also the idea because if it stay proprietary for Node OPC UA, we will create our own um implementation at the end what works for the most mqt users at the end because um it's the question do we really need to go back to opc ua or is there also a, a tiny thing in the middle uh, right. where people say i just want to go from level two and the other levels um, and there i want to go with mqt later there's so much that people don't care about in the opc standard once you get to the enterprise like once you get past level two you know what really matters <clears throat> The item path, the value, the parent, and the children. That's it. That I mean, it, that's not all that matters, but that's what people care it's about. It's more complicated if you have really big um, information models. I think it will right. have some 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 deeper uh, point where where you could say, okay, it's really more secure to go with that how it is implemented at the moment to yeah. be really sure that every device can 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 adopt this at the end. Also, from the size of devices, from the implementation, young or old. Uh, I think that's more what OPC, the OPC Foundation has to take care about. So I think that's mostly the point because we we shouldn't forget there is a lot of things that we have to retrofit <laughs> or make some right. retrofitting for. And uh, but it's not uh, to stop uh, from our perspective in the open source world to show hey that's how we think it could work. And I think also that the OPC Foundation is open enough if we show a really great implementation for this. Um, I'm working also in the ISA. Um, OPC specification uh, group, and they are also every time really open um, to discuss, to see, does it make value? Does it make sense? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think it's also the success of Highbyte to making more concentrating uh, from, from what is the value? What do we really yep. need in our implementation? 
and not just uh, uh, fancy stuff and boo 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 and ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's more how OT people or OT experience people think. We have a problem. We want to solve it, and it should be easy to use at the end. Right. It's it's it. It's a, that's a really good way. To, a good point to end it on, which is. In the OT world, it's about problems and solutions, right? I have a specific problem I'm trying to solve, and I'm trying to solve it with the shortest time to value I can possibly solve it in, right? And, um, I think oftentimes software developers think more about developing software optimal for the developer and not optimal for the user of the software, yeah. right? So um, can we use the decks? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, Oriol and Klaus, thank you for joining us, man. This is was yeah, I mean, this will be a very popular podcast. It, real quick, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way, Klaus? If somebody wants to reach out, is that LinkedIn for you? Is it some website you'd like people to visit? Same thing with you, Oriol. I think I'm really active on LinkedIn, so it's it's really the best awesome. way. And Oriol, you? Okay. Yeah, it's just my name surname, so Oriol Rius dot M E. Okay, ME. Uh, it's my web pro professional web page, and I publish a, a 10 minute video per week talking about Industry 4.0 in Spanish. <laughs> uh, hey, Josh, do me a favor. Let's make sure we include that link in the description. And then we um, will also sh include a link to the uh, Node Reb IoT OPC UA node um, from the uh, Node Red package manager. Klaus, Oriol, thank you guys for joining us. Everybody, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, comment down below, and we'll see you guys in the next one.